Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We're ready for the event. Clay Center for the Arts and Sciences, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Brian Hughes at WOWK 13, Storm Tracker Meteorologist, here with Senator Joe Manchin and students. How do you hear me? We have you loud and clear. Good to, good to have you guys on board the station. Senator Manchin. Uh, Commander Shane Kimbrough and Dr. Peggy Whiston, uh, hello from the mountain, the great mountain state of West Virginia. I'm Senator Joe Manchin. I have the true honor and pleasure of representing this wonderful state. And we're here at the beautiful Clay Center with approximately 500 students from around our state with thousands watching in on Skype right now. And we're so excited about this. We are proud to be Americans. We're proud to be West Virginians. But we're more proud of you two right now for being part of this and allowing us to be part of that with you. I have some really outstanding students who have some great questions, and we're going to get right to it. Thank you. And our first question comes from Alexis Jenkins of South Charleston High School. Hi, my question is for Peggy. What did you wish to gain personally and scientifically from this journey? Well, scientifically, this uh, increment, we have over 200 investigations that we're working on, almost actually 300. And so there's lots of different scientific objectives. And my goal from my perspective is to get as much of that done as possible. I, I always think of us as being the hands of all the scientists on the ground who proposed and developed all these investigations to be up here. Uh, personally, uh, it's just a great opportunity to contribute. Uh, I have never had another job or another part of my job that has made me uh, so personally satisfied and makes me feel like I'm contributing directly to the space flight uh, and exploration. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Anthony Gillig of Polka Middle School. Anthony. Hello. This question is for Shane. Hello, this question is for Shane. How is it living together in such a confined space? Well, very good question. We are in kind of small quarters, but it's probably bigger than you think. It's kind of like the volume of a big house on Earth. Uh, so we just can't go outside every day. So we're all kind of inside all the time. Um, so we have to make sure we're not getting on each other's nerves. Um, we have to, you know, take each other's considerations into account uh, no matter what we're doing. And it's just uh, actually great people skills that we've learned in our training uh, throughout our life to get to this point. And we're using all of those up here in this kind of closed, confined area. Thank you very much. Next up, our question comes from Kyle Casso of Hurricane High School. Hey guys, um, first off, I just wanna say you guys are both awesome and I'm so envious of you. Uh, my question is for Peggy and it's what precautions are in place to prevent the introduction of pathogens on the ISS and do ISS astronauts ever face illnesses that are not pathogen related? Well, actually, uh, we do take precautions to not introduce uh, pathogens on board. Uh, two weeks or so before we launch uh, from whatever space pad, whether it's in the United States or in uh, Russia or Kazakhstan, we start a quarantine period where we limit access to the number of people that we're exposed to, and that's to try and reduce the potential for being exposed to a pathogen and then carrying it up here to the space station. Um, but there are other illnesses or diseases that we could get uh, while we're up here that aren't pathogen related. And one that we worry about because of the bone demineralization process is actually kidney stone formation. So that would cause us to end a mission early if somebody formed a kidney stone because it's extremely painful. And if the crew member weren't able to pass a kidney stone, then uh, it would be unbearable for them and we'd have to return early. So there are things that could happen that could cause us to have a, a medical emergency and return early. Awesome answer. Thank you, guys. Wow. Who knew? Next up, Kyra Moore, Cabell Midland High School. 
Hi, um, my question is for Shane, and it's what was the biggest um, hardship you had to face on your journey to becoming an astronaut, and how did you overcome it? Wow, there's a lot of, I don't know, hardships, the right word, or obstacles or challenges that get put in front of everybody. As you guys see, as you go out onto the real world here in a few years, you're going to have things that get in your way. So I kind of looked at those, and I look at them now, especially when they're behind me, as, as opportunities and things that I can do to grow from and learn from. Um, and I developed as a person, um, as an officer in the Army, and as an astronaut um, by overcoming some of these hurdles. A lot of the way, the way I looked at these problems were with the problem um, solving skills that I had from my education as well as the, being in the Army. And, and kind of use those techniques um, to help me kind of get through that hurdle or that obstacle. And then eventually I just was lucky enough to become an astronaut. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is going to be Will Chatton from George W. High School. Hi, this question is for Peggy. We know that you've conducted research on how lighting on board the ISS affects crew members. Are you able to feel a physical effect when the lighting changes, and how can this research be applied to life on Earth? Well, actually, that's a fantastic question. We have these new lights up on board, um, and they're, uh, the first place we put them was in our crew quarters. And so the it has uh, different frequencies, different wavelengths of light uh, that are uh, primarily used in the morning, the blue wavelengths and the, versus the uh, yellow wavelengths in the evening, and it actually will help you shift earlier. So if we have, to, if our sleep schedule has to change up here, we can we can modify and use those lights to help us adapt more quickly. Um, this kind of technology is actually used on the ground for people with insomnia or uh, also uh, shift workers. And so we're just trying to apply that up here. I think even, you know, especially when we start going on exploration missions, having that lighting change during the day will help us uh, stay adapted uh, to a 24-ish hour time frame. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Next up is going to be Laura Mangold of Nicholas County High School. Hi. Um, this is for Shane. And what is communicating with your family like while you're in space? Well, we're very lucky, actually. Uh, we can talk on the phone pretty much every day I do with my family. Uh, we have once a week, we have a video conference with them as well. So that's always great to be able to see them and uh, catch up with them. We have email, of course. Uh, so we're kind of lucky, I think, in a way, to have all those resources available to us to be able to chat with our families daily. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, Madeline Turley of South Charleston High. Hi. This question is for Peggy. Um, what, uh, sorry, what advice would you give to a young woman wanting to pursue a career in the STEM field? I think probably the most important advice I can give you is pick a field that really interests you, that, in, that gives you some drive and some passion, and pursue it with all your heart. And uh, you will be successful that way. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next up, Brian Brockman of South Charleston High School will ask uh, two questions here. Uh, hi. The first question is for Shane. What is the most difficult daily task that astronauts face? Great question. I think it, the answer might surprise you, but I think the most difficult thing we do every day is just finding things. Um, we have a lot of activities on our schedule every day that are driven by the mission control centers around the world, and all those activities require getting tools and getting pieces of hardware and just getting stuff from all over this, this massive space station. So to me, the most difficult thing daily is just finding all the things you need to do your daily tasks. Thank you. The second question is for Peggy. If there's a fire on the ISS, what is the procedure? Well, the most important thing we have to worry about is making sure that ensuring our own safety. So if we see the fire, we're going to don an emergency breathing mask and make sure that we get on the right side of the fire so that we're closest to our emergency egress vehicle in case things got out of control. And then after that, we're going to fight the fire. We're going to remove 
power to try and reduce the potential for a fire. And we can use fire extinguishers. We have two different types. Some use um, uh, carbon dioxide to suffocate a fire. If it were behind one of these racks and panels, we could stick a, a fire extinguisher in there and, and suffocate it by removing the oxygen. Um, and the other type of fire that we might have is with, we have tons of laptops and things around, so if there were a battery or an open cabin fire, we would use a water mist uh, fire extinguisher. Um, so it's, it's not all that different than what you would do on the ground. We do think about the power, removing the power source, because that is going to be the primary re reason we would have a fire. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Brian. He was he also asked two questions because uh, Preston High School could not be here today, so that's why that happened. Next up, Hattie Sargent from Hurricane High School. Hi, my question's for Shane. Has your time on the ISS caused you to consider or rule out longer missions in the future, such as one to Mars? Well, I think we'll be going to Mars maybe in about 15 to 20 years. I think if we're lucky, so by that time, I'm going to be too old to be doing this. Uh, but it's your generation, really, that's going to be the ones going to Mars and taking these really long missions. So I hope you guys are ready. Um, you guys are going to be the ones that are going to take us there. Thank you. Next, Next up is Maya Rowe of George Washington High School. Hi, uh, this question is for Peggy. You have a place in history as the first female commander of the ISS. What challenges have you faced as a woman in a NASA career, and do you believe you have contributed to this trend of more women going into STEM fields? It's kind of hard to believe that me personally would have contributed to more women going into the STEM fields. I think it's just the fact that there are more and more women out there every day doing these types of jobs. And the more young people that see that, they believe they can also do those jobs. I mean, the same was true for me. Uh, you know, I became inspired to become an astronaut when I saw, after the first female astronauts were selected. So that was when I graduated from high school. And so it made a big impact on me, made me feel like it was possible. And I think the important advice that I give to young people is pursue your dreams, pursue your goals, and, you know, make an extra effort to make it happen. Nothing's going to be handed to you on a silver platter, unfortunately. So make it happen and make do the extra work to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is Jada Smith of Polka Middle School. Hi, my question's for Shane. What is one thing on Earth that you miss most when you are in space? Well, for me, it's my family. I think it is for most of us. Uh, there's all there's there's types of foods and things that you also miss, but in general, it's my family and friends and just hanging out with them. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Kendall Bostic will ask two questions. First one was from Preston High School. Hi, my first question is for Peggy. Are you required to undergo physical slash mental rehabilitation once you return to Earth? We actually have 45 days of physical rehabilitation when we get home. It's uh, to help us gain back those muscles that we don't use as much up here. Everything that we do here is so easy. Our motions, uh, it just doesn't take much to push off and move away from a wall. And so, uh, we have to get, although we maintain our strength by doing our exercise on the up here, we exercise almost two hours a day, there are lots of muscles that we're not using exactly the same way that we do on the ground. And so it takes about 45 days to get all those, those uh, senses back. And then in terms of mental rehabilitation, I don't know if there's any of that, but my husband might want me to put me in mental rehab. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, my second question is for Shane. What aspect of your work on the ISS is the most exciting to you? For example, scientific experiments and discoveries. You know, we've had such a wide variety of activities up here. I really enjoy all of it. Um, we do a lot of science, like you mentioned. We've also had a lot of robotic arm operations where we've had uh, cargo vehicles arriving that we actually reach out and grab it with the robotic arm. That's been a lot of fun. Uh, but probably the most fun and, and most exciting is doing spacewalks. And uh, we've gotten to do a few spacewalks already, and we're getting ready to do another one next Friday, uh, followed by two more after that before I head back to Earth. So those are probably my most exciting things on board. Thank you very much. Peggy, you're going to have to show Shane up and do a flip probably while answering this next question. So 
Okay, uh, we have Noah Wilbur of South Charleston High School. Hi, my question's for Peggy. With all the space debris, how do the NASA probes travel through space without colliding with something? That's a really great question. Our, NASA actually tracks a lot of the debris, but it has to be a certain size before they can track it. And I think probably the only reason we don't hit things is because space is so expansive and so large that the chances are you're just not going to hit something. But we do track large things like rocket, old rocket bodies and old satellites that are up here. And occasionally we have to maneuver the station and do a reboost or a deboost to change our altitude so that we will miss a target. Thank you. Thank you. We have about four minutes left, so we're going to try and get this knocked out here real quick. Hannah Runyon's of Polka Middle School. Hi, my question's for Shane. How long does it take for the body to completely recoup from the weightlessness atmosphere when you come back to Earth? Well, everybody's a little bit different. Uh, I've only been on a short duration mission before, so when I return to Earth here in less than a month, uh, it's going to be a new experience for me after being gone for about six months. So I hope it's only a few days, but sometimes it's a week. And then to get fully rehabilitated, like Peggy mentioned earlier, sometimes a month of 45 days for your entire body to get readjusted. Thank you. Next up is Alex Gierdorf of George Washington High School. Four questions left. Here we go. Hi guys, my question is for Peggy. So without the natural barrier of Earth's atmosphere, what precautions must the station and crew members take to be protected from radiation? And how will this radiation affect a multi-year expedition to Mars? That's a fantastic question. And the radiation here, where we are at 250 miles above the Earth is still lower than it is when, if we, uh, go on a long duration mission beyond Earth's magnetosphere. So it's the magnetic field that surrounds the Earth that protects us, and then it's even more protected down on the, on the planet because of the atmosphere. So it's that combination of atmosphere and magnetosphere that protects us. Uh, future missions are gonna have that as one of the main challenges is radiation. Thank you guys. Next up, Aaron Dodd of South Charleston High School. After this, two questions. Hi, this question is for Shane. Regarding the debates concerning the government defunding the space travel program, where do you see the future of the program going? Do you think that it will eventually face more monetary challenges? Well, the future right now is to get to get a human being on Mars. And so that's what NASA in general is gearing our, our human spaceflight program towards. So we're building vehicles, we're doing research, we're even doing a lot of that on board the ISS right now in order to be able to send a human to some place like Mars. Uh, we always do face monetary challenges. We're a government agency, like all the other agencies. We're all fighting for a big pot of money. So that's going to continue no matter uh, what's going on. NASA is always going to face struggles with trying to get more and more money. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is going to be uh, Tyler McVaney of Parkersburg High School. Hello. It's an honor to speak in, be speaking with you all today. This question is for Peggy. How do you feel the success of private companies contributing to the commercial crew program will enhance and contribute to the future of space explorations? And as an astronaut, are you excited for the possibility of riding these spacecraft in the future? Actually, we have one of those cargo vehicles right here on board to, uh, right now, and we're planning on uh, unberthing and, and releasing it at the end of the week to bring back home scientific samples. Uh, that's a SpaceX vehicle, and uh, next week we're hoping to get a Cygnus vehicle in. Uh, so we're really excited about these cargo vehicles. They give the U.S. a great capability uh, again. and. The fact that it's done commercially, I think, expands our potential for future exploration. So it's absolutely imperative. And yes, I'd be happy to get on a new, a new vehicle. Thank you. And our final question, Frederick Mooney of South Charleston High School. Hello, this is for both Peggy and Shane. Um, what steps did you take from college and beyond to get where you are now? And for a related question, what should an aspiring astronaut like me work on to train myself for? 
Well, for me, uh, I went to the United States Military Academy at West Point. So after that, uh, I went into the Army uh, obligation there. But uh, I did a career in the Army actually as a Apache helicopter pilot. But the main things throughout that career was education to get me to this, this point where I am. Education and operational experience was the path that I, I guess, used to get to into the astronaut corps. Now, Peggy's a little bit different because she came a different route, so I'll let her describe that. And uh, my interest was in science, and I got a PhD in biochemistry and then began working at NASA. And it was uh, more than 10 years working at NASA before I was lucky enough to be selected. But the, uh, for me, it was education, but coming from a scientific arena. So any field in science, engineering, math, uh, any operational field, like in the military, uh, test pilot school, all of those can apply to becoming an astronaut. And uh, I think the advice I would give is uh, really push yourself. Go beyond what you think you can actually do, because you really can. Thank you. Dr. Whitston and Commander Kimbrough, we want to thank you on behalf of everybody in the Great Mountain State, all everybody here at Clay Center in Charleston, West Virginia, all of the students, thousands of students that are watching today that tuned in for you sharing a little bit of your day to day with us. Homer Hickam, as you know, is a famous author from Colwood, West Virginia. And Homer said, he said, basically, the rocket won't fly until someone lights the fuse. Today, I hope and I think you have lit the fuse for thousands of kids in West Virginia to be up right where you are today. God bless you. Thank you for what you do for our great country and have a safe journey back home. Thank you. Standing ovation, thank you. Look at there, there's the flip for everyone. Shane, Peggy, thank you so much from West Virginia. You're welcome. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes our event. Thank you to all the participants and guests from the Clay Center for the Arts and Sciences. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.